Hey everyone, and welcome to the Ballet and Beyond podcast, where we interview current and former professionals, teachers, patrons, and more from the world of ballet and dance. You'll get insight from top dancers and instructors in the industry, as well as local performers and educators, as they talk about their experiences in the business. I'm your host today, Pete Commander. If you're from the greater Baltimore area, don't forget to check out Charm City Ballet, located in Cockeysville, where we offer classes for all dancers ages 3 through adult. Visit www.charmcityballet.com for more information on classes, auditions, and upcoming performances. This is episode 7 of Ballet and Beyond, and with us today is Goucher College Professor Rick Sutherland. Rick is Associate Professor of Dance at Goucher College and past president of the National Dance Education Organization. Rick spent more than 20 years teaching in pre-K through 12 dance education in North Carolina, Maryland, Georgia, Nevada, and Washington, D.C. Rick currently oversees the K-12 Dance Education Certification Program and teaches dance education, modern dance technique, composition, and study abroad courses on the African continent. Rick, thanks so, so much for being on with us today and doing this. Well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, anything where I can advocate on behalf of dance or using my experience to share stories so that it's further connecting the field. Uh, that's what I do. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, so let's start by talking a little bit about your story. Uh, tell us how you got into dance and then how that led you to dance education. Well, I was second grade and my mother took me and my sister to my little cousin's dance recital that June at Trust Coliseum in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I mean, very much like out of a chorus line, my story is a lot like the guy's story in that, you know, watching his sister, in this case, my cousin. And I was in, my mother couldn't keep me out of the middle of the I was dancing. I, I could do that. That's what, <laughs> and that's what I wanted to do. And so over time, mm. I, I actually uh, enrolled the next year to tap and jazz. And only took it for three years. Uh, my parents split up, and with that comes certain sacrifices. But I was very fortunate to have grown up, actually, in a very art-savvy school system at the time, near Hanover County Schools. And so I had the opportunity in the middle school to engage in theater and chorus and visual arts. I was always uh, I was very consistent in theater throughout both middle school and high school. I didn't do course in high school, and I then I got involved in a lot in the creative writing courses. There was dance offered when okay. I was in high school, um, but and I would peek in on classes. But having grown up in the South at the time, and and just seeing. A lot of friends being treated differently because they were gay or perceived as gay or anything other, really. And so, for whatever reason, I think that's why I refrained from, you know, taking dance class in high school. Then I ended up at East Carolina University for my undergraduate degree. They okay. have a conservatory model dance program. And at the time, so they offered a BFA. But at the time, they also offered a BA in dance education. And I thought to myself, you know, well, two things. First, I was originally going to school for um, clothing construction and design because I was going to be the next Jean-Paul Gaultier. I was a Madonna fanatic. And, of course, he designed for her and for many, many other famous people. But that's how I was introduced. And it inspired me. And. And then I noticed in college there were uh, tap classes offered. I didn't re read too deeply about that they had a dance program or anything. And I thought, well, this will be my art selective. So, you know, I enrolled in tap. And by the second semester, they had me enrolling in all these other dance classes because I was really a guy. So, right. and because I also could move. You know, I had some other abilities, you know, where they wanted me to just start dancing. I thought to myself, well, 
let me do the BA in dance education because I know I teaching was also something that I think was really inherent in me because I remember growing up, I always play in school and I was a teacher and making tests. And so I said, let me do the dance education. And it was really when I enrolled in that first course, it was called Perspectives of Dance Education like a one credit seminar and we would have to go into different public schools at different levels, you know, and observe. And I just remember one day watching a high school class. I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm going to be certified K-12. And yet I recognize where I lack, like from a, a technical perspective, and, and at that age, uh-huh. there's no guarantee. I, you know, we get a middle school or an elementary, you know, school position. So I went and had a, a conversation with our the director of the school of theater and dance, His name was John Sharon. and he said basically go do the BFA. Long term, it's going to serve you far better. And so knowing that I lacked technically, I focused in on all the composition classes. And so that's when I told the, and of course, started taking the modern, the ballet, the jazz, because we were required to do all of that. And then we concentrate in basically what they tell us we're going to concentrate in for the last two years. But I remember them telling me, they're like, we're accepting you into this BFA program because of your creative potential, not because of where you stand technically. So, right. so I'm, right. that's really how I got my start. And then right after college, so I have this BFA in dance and, and performance and choreography, but I had a lot of friends in the school system and, and I, my heart was not set on going to New York City at all. And so I was torn. I thought, you know, let me work for a little bit. So I moved in with my dad, who then lived in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I had friends teaching the school system. And so they um, encouraged me to apply and do what was then called alternative lateral entry, which is an alternative pathway to working towards your state teacher certification. Well, okay. I taught that year, uh, fourth and fifth grade, actually dance and drama in a program Wake County Public Schools used to have called uh, the Basic Education Program, where all the elementary schools had dance and theater, uh, as well as art and music in every elementary school. So I was what they called an itinerant teacher, meaning I only worked maybe two days at one school, a day and a half at another, and a day and a half at another. So I was always traveling between schools. Mm -hmm. I loved it so much. It scared Mm. me so much because I fell in love with teaching and with the, you know, just really seeing how creative we were as children before the world and the things and the structures, you know, that we entered uh, through our education systems and social systems. And I'm like, oh, my God, why do we why do we just carve out the creative potential that's inherent in each and every one of us? So that was really the gut of it all for me and then you know I after that first year I left because of my first long-term uh, boyfriend and partner who moved to San Francisco so I quit the job after a year went to San Francisco you know and did odd jobs and and that's where I began uh, or was exposed to West Coast release technique First time I ever took a dance class without music. It was all about, you know, your breath and the blood. And so that really uh, about how I saw technique and also performance and all that. It, it, it really kind of was a turning point. Plus, you know, because I still love teaching, too. So it informed me in so many wonderful ways. 
I was in San Francisco for a couple of years, ended up moving back to North Carolina to care for my father, who was fighting cancer. So me and my sister took care of him. And I remained in Raleigh, ended up getting a job back in Wake County for about another year. And then doing the same thing, uh, teaching in the basic education program, went back to East Carolina University. Then they had a program called Project ACT. ACT is an acronym for Alternative Certification for Teachers. This program was the model program for what we now know as Masters of Arts in Teaching in institutions around the country. So I was like in the second cohort of that, you know, and in a year you complete your state required coursework, you have to have obviously a degree in a discipline already. And so it's just the, the education mandated courses, which I received at graduate level. So, okay. so now I have some grad courses under my belt. I ended up getting a job teaching at Riverside High School in Durham, North Carolina full time. I built a program there from about 50 students to almost 200 students in less than three years. Uh, I was very energetic and engaged. I got my students exposed to a lot of different things. I took them to the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade where they performed. We were invited to perform in the halftime show at the Nokia Sugar Bowl. Oh, wow. Uh, they performed in the opening closing ceremonies of the 1999 Special Olympic World Summer Games that was hosted in North Carolina then. So I was always getting them to make connections and to network. That was something I always believed in. No matter how good the quality of your work is, none of it's any good if you don't go out and develop relationships. So, you know, and of course, a lot of what I believe then and some recent research and an article that I put out, networking was one of the findings about, you know, this idea of having an entrepreneurial orientation. So these were skill sets that somehow I I don't I, I don't recall specifically gaining by taking a business course or anything like that, because I certainly never took a business course. But I just discovered that. And from that, a lot of my students were able to go to great schools and do just and and I think a lot of it also inspired students. I would have never guessed who would moved forward into a, a dance career, particularly many of them that I taught in high school went on to become dance educators themselves in the public. School. Okay. But yeah, there was that. I got my first master's degree at American University. And then later on, I was torn between getting either a PhD or an MFA because I knew after teaching elementary through high school for about 15, 16 years that I wanted to transition to higher ed and because I believed in death education. And so another thing that also was very central in my career path was my engagement with the National Dance Education Organization. I remember in college, we went to a um, state conference, but it was hosted by the um, AFERD, which is the old school education, recreation, and dance organization. When we went, it was like one dance session. And everything else was about physical education. So from an early start, because that was at that time the only dance organization represented nationally, I never got involved after that, you know, because I had a different perspective, I think, largely because I did end up going through the BFA. So I had a very dance as an art form perspective, but because of my passion for teaching and learning. I personally felt this idea, you know, which happens to be in the National Dance Education Organization's uh, logo, of, you know, dance is an art form in education. And so before I left North Carolina, that's when NDEO started forming, and, and I've been following them. And when we got to Washington, D.C., where I began my graduate studies at American, 
within weeks after getting here, I was at the NDEO office introducing myself to Jane Bombright, an executive director, and one of their education program directors were in the favor. Next thing I know, they had me, you know, writing up the charter for state affiliate called the Capital Region Educators of Dance Organization, Credo. And it was, I think, like the third or fourth state affiliate to the national organization. I served as charter president, helped find monies to, you know, do a website. That organization actually just disbanded only about five, six years ago. Um, okay. When the Maryland Dance Education Association decided to do something different and because they were involved with AFERD, had their state conferences as well as NDEO and a couple other different little dance organizations. So when Ken Krzyzewski was the Maryland, yeah, Maryland Department of Education as director of the arts programming for the state, he decided to pull the organizations together and they all had discussions and felt like, you know, we're going to align with NBO and it's just one state organization kind of thing. So they did that. So that was going to be uh, my next question. Tell us a little bit about the general goals and work of the NDEO. Well, our, our vision is all children have a right to dance. That's the fundamental belief. And in that quality dance education, and in an effort to provide that, we need highly certified dance educators, whether they're in public schools, private or parochial schools, studios of dance, performing arts organizations, it doesn't matter where. And so from a public sector perspective, we have been very involved with dance standards, you know, very early on in the 90s and then following up, actually led the way with the new Common Core Standards for the Arts. And if you ever look at them, that framework and formatting, for the most part, was really um, appreciated and adopted by the other art forms. Mm, Um, So, you know, about standards, about access to dance education, you know, what is highly qualified. And again, looking at different areas where dance education exists, we we have a clear understanding of what that is for K-12 public schools by nature of what state and federal policies state for teacher credentialing. And with private students of practice, there are a variety of ways Historically, with private studios, you, the re- most reason people started studios is because they took from their parents or they took from whoever the local one. You just had this passion. You didn't go to college. You just opened your own studio, you know. Right. And so looking at ways to reach out, you know, just to inform about, you know, healthy dance teaching practices. So we're seeing the standard across the board happening with studios as far as elevating what's good and what's healthy dance. And, you know, a shout out to Nigel Lipko, who endorses all that NDO does and did so, you know, on most of his shows. So that's been helping to help bridge the gap of all of where dance is and what dance education is. It's helped allow for the private sector and the public sector come together and, and have conversations. Dance is just such a, we're such a small field and we all know our dance and how, you know, if you do ballet, <laughs> you can't do modern. If you do modern, you can't do ballet, you know. Right. And if you do those, you can't do West African and if you can't do what, you know, and, and you can't do uh, And so, you know, and I'm kind of over who says who can do what. If you got a body, you can dance. And the other part of it, too, which is part of the problem of the professional side is, yes, as an educator, I know I'm not there to create, if I have a classroom of 25 students five times a day, 125, 50 professional dancers. But what I am doing, 
is sustaining an art form by also developing an audience. Mm. People who have been exposed, who understand, and long term, keep putting money into the industry. And that's what I also recognize. And, and that's an entrepreneurial kind of mindset to be thinking about it in that way. And that's why dance education and or because I love this art form so much for it to continue and hopefully grow, but just to simply sustain, we have to start young and continue growing the audience. And that's what is fundamental to also to the National Dance Education Organization, which is why I just quickly connected. It was it, the right feeling. And recently, we just put out our new national priorities, which is cultivate leadership, building knowledge, and making connections. Uh-huh. So, and that's sort of our 10-year plan. It's our applied strategic plan. We decided to try something different that isn't a norm for businesses. Uh, but you all, all know, we all know that your strategic plan is like a living, breathing document, too. It's just a plan. So the way we've designed it, we've designed it and framed it with these priorities. You know, if we're going to grow, we know we need to connect people. Part of that connection is engagement. And that engagement comes through, you know, just all the research and information. Right. right. You know, and then out of that, the reality with most dance teachers, the kind of stress is we're all leaders. We're the only ones in that classroom with those children. We're the only ones putting a whole show together on a very basic level. Right. So we need to help them own that agency. They need to know how to advocate for themselves so they can get what it is that they need based on the rights that these children and this organization believes they should all have access to Dan. Right. Right. So, you know, I mean, I'm not happy to leave or, you know, step down from them, but I'm happy at where we are. Right. And that I was part of some really just wonderfully dynamic work that will make a difference because of the meaning of it. It has been so meaningful, not just for me, but everybody who has been involved with the organization. Mm. I'm going to switch gears if that's okay. So when you get new students into Goucher, you have them, you know, give or take for four years. What are some of your goals for them coming through the program? What do you... Uh, look for when they're coming in and what do you hope they leave with on the way out? Well, my personal goal is that I don't teach dance. I teach life skills and that dance is the content through which those skills are understood. Our medium is dance. That's where kinesthetic learners so there are ways in which i can show them really in many ways what they already know through the discipline of dance and make those real world connections so that's really what the goal is i mean yes we're still training in our classrooms and the technique classrooms we still have high expectations for them to really push beyond their boundaries to the composition courses and in their academic writing through dance. And, you know, what I appreciate about being at a liberal arts school is that we're able to help help them understand how all the classes, whether they're of the dance discipline or not, are really a lot more interrelated than they realize. Mm. So I know that whoever leaves our program, they're all not going to become performers. And certainly they're all not going directly into the top ballet companies as soloists. But what they do know, and I hope those life skills and and uh, in large part because of some of the research I uncovered in my entrepreneurial orientation work 
was how to take what you know and be able to communicate that in effective ways and how to do that so that they are able, if they can't get the work they want, they know how to create the work they want. Okay. Okay. You know, yeah. One thing, you know, I keep in, I do keep encouraging our dance students to do, and I can't imagine any dance professional at any stage or level or educator could argue they all need to take a basic pedagogy class. They all somehow, somewhere, some way, someday, especially for a quick buck, might be asked to teach a master class. Right. And you should know how to design a fundamentally decent class so that it's of good quality, so that one, you get invited back, two, on a personal note, I, uh, and at, for Goucher, we know we've done our job. <laughs> oh, right. Right. Yeah. But teaching is not as scary as everybody Thing, you know, and, and I can also understand particularly our students who come in are just so performance geared, how frightening it is to be telling people what to do rather than to be told what to do, oh, right. you know, and I'm not saying that that's just, you know, not always the truth, but they, they, they become challenged to transition into a more leadership and, and more vocal role. So... Mm. Okay. So are there things that you feel like higher education and dance could be doing better? And if so, what are some of those things? Well, one, stay ahead of the time with this shift in higher education across the board. A couple of things. One, you know, we're, we're going to see many, many more, particularly small private colleges closing in the next seven to 10 years, there's going to be continued downsizing. It's going to have a, with the growing trend of community colleges, you know, becoming free, you're even going to see the four-year institutions that are public institutions be impacted by that. What's been interesting that I've come across though, is a lot of arts programs have been popping up more and more in higher ed. Mm. So I'm not sure what that is and what that means yet. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm kind of happy to, well, I am happy to hear that, but I'm not going to speculate. Right, right. But we need to understand who our demographics are. We know particularly Goucher, that is changing rapidly. Our learners are different every year as a result of technology. Like okay. every year, I can tell a small difference of the student incoming classes from this year to the incoming class from the year prior. So we need to constantly be tooled. I know particularly for colleges like Goucher, we are a teaching college. Yes, we do research, but I think that we need to think more deeply about how we think about our research. So if we want to go do that choreography, we need to include the pedagogical aspect to it so that we are developing ourselves as professor teachers because we're not like other institutions where, okay, you're going to be in Professor Yadada's class, but the class is actually being taught by the graduate assistant. Uh huh. And at Goucher, their promise is that you're taught by the professor, you know, and so we're a teaching college and, and we're feeling some growing pains as a college and we're jumping on board with a lot of professional development initiatives on our campus so that we can maintain the high quality of the teaching that we do provide for our students at Goucher. And so that it, it helps us improve our teaching, you know, and how we teach and helps us rethink and reframe some things that aligns with, of course, the expectations of Goucher, but also really does align with much of what we're already doing in the field. Right, right. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch gears one more time, if that's okay, and talk a little bit about, about CCB, actually. 
I guess that was four years ago, uh, we came to you and asked you to be a part of Beauty and the Beast. And since then, you've become what Beck and I think of as a crucial and irreplaceable part of <laughs> CCB and what we're doing. And for lack of a better way of asking it, why did you end up agreeing to do that? And what about this type of performance um, do you think was worth your time to take to do that? I did it really, in retrospect, for very personal reasons. Kind okay. of to, I mean, because I love the performing arts, obviously. Um, so from a professional perspective, was my age consideration and how much longer will I be able to do? Because I teach modern dance and I'm always upside down and on my back. Da, da, da. <laughs> so I don't know if I can, how much longer I'm going to be able to be upside down and on my back and doing what I do in that form. So I thought these are character roles. It will require something different of my body. Mm but also something I've always believed in, you know, as a dance instructor, professor, particularly in, you know, technique classes and watching students perform. It's like everything is beautiful, but their face. It's like, y'all, there's such a disconnect. What's going on there? Where's the emotion in the face? And a lot of that comes from my own background you know, being in theater, of course, all through middle and high school. And right. I have a minor in theater, you know, to go along with my BFA. And I had to take some acting classes and perform straight acting as well. So I picked up a few things along the way. And of course, all of my favorite dances I have ever seen is in large part because of the expression on their faces as connected to the rest of the body. I could see the whole body when the face is connected. Mm. So for me, it was an opportunity to get back into my fine motor muscle self because I'm having to look at physical details in a, such a different way. What is my facial? Because I'm not speaking. This is a ballet. And I... I am the different characters. So part of it is me doing also some research, you know, do a little reading. Fortunately, the stories that I've done for them, I've seen since I was a child or, I mean, Beauty and the Beast when and Little Mermaid, when they were so popular in the 90s, I was teaching elementary and I used that stuff and watched those movies in the classroom, you know. So a lot of that was my own experience and my perception of who these characters were over time. Doing again, reading a lot. I'm a very visual person, and also having been a dance teacher for so long, my observation, physical observation skills, especially if it's still life, just looking at how they're holding their hand, that fingertip, the the eyebrow, you know, just all those fine details. So I, I look at a lot of pictures. I'll go back and look at a particularly playing the role of Scrooge. I'll go and each year kind of look at a different movie that had that character in it, see, mm. you know, something else I might pick up. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard work. <laughs> you know, the easy parts of it is when I'm doing the set choreography that you and Beck put on me. <laughs> right. <laughs> like right. on my body. Having to hold your character and muscular, you know, in a particular way. And, and it isn't just one face. It isn't the gross motor, which is about bigger, longer lines. It's all those tiny muscles in those funky spaces in our bodies <laughs> that you have to pay attention to in right. order to find that the physical demeanor of that character you're portraying. Mm. So, speaking of character, you've played a very wide range of characters for us, and and 
you had mentioned it's it's ballet, so that you're not using your voice. What are some of the things that you think about while you're developing and practicing these characters? Well, I think about the storyline a lot. I think about the other characters in space. I think about the plays because I I I, I work to find the authenticity in that moment, so that every time I'm on that stage, in that scene, I, I try to keep it a, at a natural space so that I'm acting and reacting and reacting and, and not, you know, put on a recording. Right. You know, not being my own corps de ballet so that every night, every performance is identical to every night and every, and that's never been the case. Mm. You know, for me in that situation, I have stage directions and I know roughly where I need to be as a related to others. But what actually ends up coming out of my body, yes, I get into character and I hold myself. And we know it's live theater, too. So there might be other, you know, unexpected uh, obstacles. So I see that. I'm always dealing in unexpected obstacles, so it has that kind of improvisatory thing that helps keep it fresh, especially for me. When you're on stage, 90% of a show in the Royal of Scrooge, and, and I'll say 50% of that time, you're just standing there under a light, you right. know, that is really the hardest thing in the world to be in character. So I'm constantly having conversations in my mind, even if other people are there, trying to and respond to them. So I'm sort of talking to myself. And I also know that I, I have to, one thing, other things, so that the fine motor uh, movement material, this detail does get noticed, there is a certain level of engagement of the gross motor uh, muscles that you have to involve. It's kind of like projecting your voice to the audience. So you have to kind of, it's like you're carrying yourself and then you're over carrying. So there's this like slight, I don't know how to else to say it or express it, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, an area I'm fascinated with in terms of movement and the idea of projection. Mm. So you take all this, you do all this work to stay in character. And we've talked, you and I have talked a little bit about the sort of power that's behind a character like Scrooge and a story like A Christmas Carol. And obviously, you know, Dickens was a genius. But talk a little bit about why a story like this is so important and why it's, I should say, why you feel like it's so important to embody this character the way that you do. For me, personally, on many levels, one is a gay man who's always kind of had to go down my own pathway, um, feeling like I'm alone in the world. I think having had experienced multiple times significant loss in my life, that has shifted my direction. And out of all of that, just kind of threw me into some very deep, dark places. And fortunately, you know, friends or things here and there happened so that, that, you know, the light came and kind of pulled me out each time. I see this as, I think right now, more than anything, this is a story about a white heterosexual male who is at the top of his world. And because of circumstances that he felt like he couldn't control and he knew he could have to suppress his feelings and, and all of this anger inside and that over time he became this alone, miserly, you know, person. And, you know, what the story represents is an opportunity and demonstrates the ability we all have is called reflection and productive reflection and towards our ability as humans to be actually self-inspiring by our own stories to kind of 
pull ourselves from the bottom, clean the, clear the slate and, and start over in a wider way, you know, in a more positive way, understanding what it means to forgive the self, understanding really what identity is and that in this situation and the way I see it in this current political, social, and cultural climate we're dealing. Yeah, it's it's about trying to strip away identities that perhaps we really aren't. And this that's what I appreciate about this story, particularly right now, that it's an opportunity to say, I am human. I am a successful human who's made mistakes, but who sees through all of this and is going to do differently is going to consciously make efforts because he recognizes he does need people. He recognizes that power for the individual is by empowering those around you, not disempowering, not disenfranchising, not being corrupt, not being dingy and greedy, but the power is in the people all around us. And that's what the story represent this straight, white, male, white, very Christian, obviously, because this is a Christian-based story, who grew up and saw the real picture of the world around him. And the only way we see those pictures is by dealing with the world inside of ourselves. This episode was brought to you by Charm City Ballet. If you live in the Greater Baltimore area, don't forget to check out Charm City Ballet located in Cockeysville. Visit www.charmcityballet.com for information on classes, auditions, and upcoming performances. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and give Ballet and Beyond a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For questions and guest requests, please email us at balletandbeyondpodcast at gmail.com. I'm your host, Pete Commander. Thanks for listening.